Hello, friends, and welcome to this afternoon's presentation, What's That Waiting Bird? This is James Stevenson with the University of Florida IFAS Extension Services here in Pinellas County. It's good to see you all this afternoon. Um, Pinellas County Extension is an extension of the University of Florida here in Pinellas County, and we are a partnership with the county. You're probably aware of some of our activities. Um, some of them are natural resource conservation, which is what brings, I hope, a lot of you here today. I'm coming to you from Brooker Creek Preserve. It's our largest preserve in Pinellas County. It's nearly 9,000 acres of undeveloped Pinellas County, which is a rarity. We are 98% built out. If you haven't been to the preserve, the trails are currently open. Uh, the Education Center, where we do most of our programming, is currently closed. Today is a special day. It's the kind of uh, soft opening of a new series that we've developed over the next couple of months in the absence of our in-person uh, educational opportunities that we offer. Uh, we've come up with a series called Florida Supernature, and we've got a variety of subjects coming up. Uh, you can register for them at bit.ly bit slash capital F FL Nature. Uh, that's all you need. And we'll be doing weekly uh, presentations like today, next week, Bugs and Butterflies, Life of Lichen on the 13th, Botanical Science for Beginners, which is quite fun, Kitchen Botany, Woodpeckers, Spice Science, Invasive Plants, and so on. Just remember that when you do go to this bit.ly FL Nature, uh, you don't get a reminder. You'll need to put that uh, You'll need to put that webinar on your own calendar. We don't send a reminder, so. Good afternoon. This is James Stevenson with the University of Florida, IFAS Extension Services in Pinellas County, Florida. Welcome to What's That Waiting Bird? The waiting birds are fun to observe if you're a new or even a seasoned bird watcher. They're easy to see. You can spot them even from the car. They're not particularly shy. Um, they don't, uh, they feed during the day, which is very handy as well. They're, most of them you can observe uh, all day long, but the wading birds aren't necessarily all related to each other. They just have similar adaptations for life at water's edge. They have long legs, long necks, and modified beaks, depending on what food they're after. What do you think this guy eats wading by the water? Mm -hmm. Others, not related, but still with the same adaptations, the long legs that allow them to uh, wade through the water, an elongated neck that lets them reach the water where this particular bird uh, isn't a stabbing bird, it's more of a filtering bird, has a modified beak for that. Again, an unrelated bird with long legs, long neck, and a modified beak, this one for probing. This species actually uses its downturned beak to probe. So they're not all related to each other, but they do have similar characteristics that put them in this group of birds that are called the wading birds. This includes bitterns, egrets, and herons. Uh, those three groups are actually related to each other, and they do have um, physiological characteristics that look similar to one another. The ibis and spoonbills, they're another group. Those two are related to each other, but not to the egrets. Um, the storks, sadly only one kind of stork here in Florida, all by himself, uh, and only one limpkin in his entire family. A limpkin is a completely unique bird in and of itself. So that's what we're gonna to cover today. I hope that suits you all. It's great to see you, like I said, and we'll go ahead and wade into the subject matter of wading birds. We'll start with the bitterns. Bitterns are very secretive. Um, you're lucky to see them. They're much more often heard than seen. There are two bitterns, the American bittern and the least bittern. Now they have uh, a, a name unique in and of themselves, even though yes, they are related to the egrets and herons, mostly because of their, uh, uh, their camouflage and their, the way they live, their secretive way of life. I was mentioning earlier that many of the wading birds are not secretive, they allow you to approach. These are ambush predators. And here you can see they have these funny adapted legs and they tend to hang on to side-by-side -side reeds. Uh, and they can kind of hover above uh, a marshland uh, clinging to the reeds. 
this is a young one, you can still see some of the fuzz on his head. The bitterns uh, adopt a posture uh, looking up, you can see they can see what's beneath them, but they're pretending and doing a very good job at being grass. So this is probably the last thing that a bullfrog in the reeds is going to see if he even notices it at all. And speaking of notice, this is what bitterns look like in the wild. Spot the bittern? No. Mm -mm. You're probably not gonna unless it flies. So those are the secretive bitterns. Herons and egrets, um, that's just kind of semantics. They're both in the same family. Uh, herons, egrets. Uh, egrets tend to have some extra plumage and herons tend not to, but that's not a hard and fast rule. But they are still related. The same adaptations and that stabbing beak that's not unique, but characteristic of this family. Uh, a a dagger-like beak both herons and egrets and our bitterns have that dagger-like beak that they use to stab their prey. The snowy egret is our smallest egret. And here you can see those aigrettes, those, that fancy plumage that gives the egret group its name. Uh, this one is in full display in its mating colors. It's mating plumage, I should say. So herons and egrets, basically the same thing, uh, just depending on a small modification in plumage. The great egret, our largest egret, and I must say most of our egrets were nearly wiped out because of this specialized breeding plumage. Uh, they were stuck in hats. Yep, stuck in hats, and that nearly led to the demise, the extinction of an entire group of birds. Uh, even the word egret comes from the little, uh, little add-on to the hat um, in certain military and uh, musical applications, the aigret. That's, so the name of the birds uh, is derived from the way that they were uh, used. Thankfully, populations are rebounding, some of which haven't even yet started to rebound after the fur, uh, feather trade was uh, abandoned earlier in the last century. The great egret in flight, you can see with his majestic bright yellow bill and outstretched legs. This is typical of how the herons and egrets and bitterns fly. They have a specialized S-shaped bone that allows them to tuck their head in when they're flying, and they generally fly with their legs outstretched. It gives us a good opportunity to note the size, uh, the color of the bill, and the color of the feet when these birds are in flight. The great egret is bigger than a duck, I think we can all picture how big a duck is. So this is our large, one of our larger egrets. The snowy egret, which it could be confused with, is much smaller. And you'll note some other differences. I pointed out the bright yellow beak of the great egret. The snowy egret's beak is black, and it's about the size of a duck, maybe a little bit smaller. So no mistaking if you see uh, a one of the white egrets standing next to a duck. Uh, you can either guess that it's the little snowy or the great. Another thing about the snowy, uh, he's got yellow feet. And you can see that he's got his neck tucked in, he's got his black beak, smaller bird, but you can really notice those yellow feet, both when he's waiting, uh, looking for food, or even in flight. And one way to remember, it's a little vulgar, one way to remember um, snowy egret is uh, something to do with yellow snow, if you kind of catch my drift. Another one of our egrets, the reddish egret. Uh, this is one of our egrets that has had the hardest time rebounding from the feather trade. Uh, they have very few breeding colonies. Uh, their numbers aren't picking up very much, but we're lucky to have a, a, reprodu a reproducing population here in Pinellas County. They have very striking plumage. They're called reddish for their kind of rust colored plumage. Um, and this particular animal is displaying um, a behavior that's almost unique to the reddish egret. Uh, this bird runs and jumps and leaps and flaps about in shallow water, uh, trying to scare up fish from the bottom or just get them confused or dazed um, in order to catch them. So it does this really funny dance out in the water. So if you, if you see, an, an egret 
uh, with this particularly black tipped beak dancing around like crazy in the water, you're probably looking at a reddish egret and you're lucky because uh, they're not many, that many, uh, not as many as others here in the county. Here's a lovely picture of a reddish egret in flight. And again, like all the other egrets, tucking its neck in and extending its leaves. This one has quite a good wingspan, probably about four or five feet. I'm gonna let you guess what kind of um, egret this is. You might've heard of it based on its company here. That's the cattle egret. And the cattle egret is a small egret. You can probably picture the size of a cow. So about the size of a cow's face, maybe a little bit smaller. And the cattle egret has an interesting story. We don't quite know how they got here to the United States, to North America in particular. They did arrive naturally, but no one's quite sure how or when. Uh, theories include a handful or a, a colony of birds even being caught up in a, in, a, in a hurricane that came off the coast of Africa where they're native, but they're established. They're not considered invasive. They got here naturally. Like all of our other egret friends, tucking the neck and extending the feet. But you can kind of notice in this slide that the cattle egrets have a bit of a brownish kind of tawny colored mohawk and a little bit of the same color on their breast. Whereas the great egret and the snowy egret, they don't have any extra colors. So this cattle egret is about the size of a snowy, but remember the color of the feet and those extra patches on the cattle egret help distinguish this one. Again, the egrets can see what they're after. And again, this is probably the last thing that a grasshopper would see. So herons and egrets, let's look at a couple of herons. The great blue heron, um, this is our largest heron and it's so named great because it's so tall. Blue because it has this kind of slaty blue color. Um, it also has little epaulets of rust during breeding season, it does produce some rather long uh, pin feathers on its head and a nice mane of, of very thin feathers here and there. The great blue is much bigger than a duck. And this duck is probably trying to see the great blue off. Uh, the great blue is a voracious predator, eats anything it can fit in its mouth, including ducklings, sadly, uh, fish, frogs, snakes, what have you. Uh, these can sometimes be seen in more terrestrial habitats, not necessarily always by the water, but they're quite happy in fresh and salt water as well. Again, can't stress enough, if you see a bird flying with its neck tucked in and its feet stretched out, you're looking at one of our heron egret complex. The tricolored heron, uh, so named for this beautiful slate, rust, and white coloration. Uh, this one is very easily recognized by the white stripe that runs along the neck that's visible both when the neck is tucked in and when it's outstretched. It's also got a bright white belly, so that makes the tricolored heron pretty distinguishable. Here is the tricolor in breeding plumage. And here, just walking along, you don't get a good look of, at all the colors that are associated with this plumage, but you can see that white stripe along the neck and possibly the belly as well. Here he is in flight. Again, in flight, you can see the white belly uh, and that white striped neck. About the same size as a tricolor is the little blue. We have the great blue and we have the little blue. Uh, the difference between the little blue and the tricolor, despite the fact that they're about the same size, is that the little blue is solidly colored as an adult. It's all one shade, well, basically the same shade of blue throughout. When in breeding plumage, it does get a little bit more violet around the head and neck area. But this beautiful slaty blue, uh, characteristic of the little blue. Egretta carulia. Carulia actually means blue. And unfortunately, when they're young, they're white. This is just the juvenile plumage, uh, but what you can notice is the black, tap, black tipped beak on an egret about the size of a tricolor. Um, eventually, this animal will go through what's called a pied phase, or a, yeah, just a, a more mottled phase as it's shedding its white feathers and getting that blue plumage. So this again is an immature, sub-adult, little blue, uh, transitioning from that white 
I almost said foliage because I'm a botanist, feathers, plumage even, uh, into the blue feathers, plumage of the adult. And I mentioned before that a lot of these birds are active during the day. Here's two whose names imply a slightly different lifestyle. The black crowned and the yellow crowned night herons. Now these are crepuscular. That's a fancy word that means they're active at dawn and dusk when light is just barely there. They have large red eyes that allow them to see in dim light. And they tend to sit uh, very still and quiet waiting for their prey to come by. They don't actually run off after them. They sit very, very still waiting for something to hopefully not notice them, swim by that they can grab with their powerful heron dagger-like beaks. Now, obviously black crowned, meaning this, the, the plumage on the, the top of the head versus the yellow crowned might look a little bit more white, but it's technically called the yellow crowned. Uh, that's the easiest way to tell the adults apart. The juveniles are almost indistinguishable. And I don't know how much it matters uh, to you if you've got a juvenile night heron correctly identified, but there are ways to tell. The black crowned has a more bicolored beak, uh, the lower being much more yellow than the top, also a bit more pointy. I'm just telling you ways to tell these things apart. It's up to you to remember how. The yellow crown juvenile, on the other hand, is a more solid colored beak. So there you have it. It's a, if it's important to you, it can be done. The juvenile night herons. Green heron, this one is also active during the day, but it's another one of those kind of, we refer to some prey, uh, I mean, predators as lie in wait. They hang out and wait for prey to walk by. So the green heron also tends to have his neck tucked in and he just kind of hangs out waiting for something to walk by. A beautiful, beautiful emerald green um, plumage on the back feathers, a rust colored neck. Uh, and I said, generally they sit with their neck tucked in like the night herons. Uh, they're about 10 times bigger than a frog. So they're not that big. They're one of our smaller. And they do sometimes stick their neck out, especially when they're agitated or when it's time to get married. This one is probably yelling at someone or something that has gotten too close. So extending his neck to its full height and frizzing out that crest plumage, uh, making him look much bigger and arguably extremely fierce. So those are the herons, egrets complex. All those birds that we just discussed are related to one another, uh, just variations on a theme, if you will, the various species that have found their way into different niches, different feeding habits, different um, nesting times, and all these other things that that create species within a family. We'll move on to our next family, uh, including uh, a bird that was sacred. Well, I guess pretty much everything was sacred to the Egyptians, wasn't it? Um, this is Toth, the god of knowledge and learning. So I think if Toth is around, he's probably around today as we uh, explore some knowledge and learning today. Uh, of course, with the head of an ibis. Um, now, we have our own, this is not the Egyptian species of ibis, we have our own southeastern ibis, but we, on, we only have two. We have the white ibis, which isn't always found around water. It's often found around water, and it's definitely got the adaptations, the modified beak and the long legs that allow it to wade and search for food, but these are also can be found in small or large groups terrestrially, kind of going through your yard looking for grubs. So they're adapted for uh, a wading lifestyle as well as a more terrestrial lifestyle. They're about the same size as a tricolor heron. They might often be seen feeding together. They might be looking for the same things. So I would assume this is a bit of an argument over territory. So they're medium sized wading birds. When they fly either singly or in groups, you can see the dark patches of uh, pigment uh, on the wingtip feathers. That black pigment adds strength to the wingtips, and the wingtips are where the most force is exerted in flight. So having white, I mean, black wingtips 
allows for that part of the wing to be that much stronger and not wear out quite so quickly. It's not unique to the ibis, uh, but in an otherwise white bird, you don't notice this until they're in flight. The juvenile ibis is also uh, in different, looks different from the adults, as, uh, even though they get to be the same size. Uh, immature ibis go through a, a modeled phase similar to the little blue egret and little blue heron. And in this case, they're more brown and white than blue and white. Plus you can't mistake that down curved beak, that down curved bill that they use to probe. Our other species of ibis is actually expanding its range. They traditionally had been extirpated. That means they had been chased out of Pinellas County uh, during the boom of development, but they're beginning to find their way back into the county, both from the north and from the south, is the glossy ibis. A beautiful bird, again, same with the downturned, uh, doesn't tuck his neck in when he's flying and you see that downturned, you're looking at an ibis. Uh, the glossy ibis has the same uh, feeding mechanisms, feeding strategies, I should say, as the white ibis, but they're much more likely to be found in freshwater habitats. Uh, they rarely tend to go into terrestrial areas like their white cousins, the, the white ibis do. So we're seeing these animals move back into Pinellas County. We've had a pretty good uptick in their numbers up here in the North County, up at Brooker Creek where we are, near Tarpon Springs and some of the freshwater areas. We've, we've been noticing them and that's a good thing. That means their numbers are increasing. A cousin to the ibis is the very distinctive and unmistakable roseate spoonbill. This is probably one of the most photographed birds in Florida. It's not a flamingo and it's not related to flamingo, but it's a pink bird. It's a pretty large pink bird, but you cannot mistake that funny face. Uh, the spoon bill that the roseate spoon bill uses to filter water uh, to eat the tiny, tiny little crustaceans and miniature fish uh, that it uses that uh, spoon shaped beak um, to filter. In flight, you can't obviously, I mean, nothing else is pink that's going to be flying around. No native bird with a, with a flat nose and a pink wingspan. There's, it's just, there, it can't be anything else. Uh, their feeding strategy is to sweep their head back and forth in shallow water. Uh, they have extremely sensitive nerve endings around uh, the edge of the beak on the top and the bottom so they can detect the slightest bit of movement and distinguish that slightest bit of movement uh, from what could be sediment or food. And it can choose the food, swallow it down. Uh, doesn't sound like a very easy living, but obviously the spoonbills have got it down. Uh, spoonbills are bald so they can stick their head underwater if they need to and not mess up their, not mess up their hair, do kind of like mine. Uh, just get rid of it so you don't have to mess with it, right? Here's three of our waders. We met the great egret at very first. We just saw the rosette spoonbill, so you can see the size difference there. Our next bird is the one that's all out on a limb, literally here, but out on a limb by himself taxonomically. There's no other bird that's related to the limpkin. And the limpkin as compared to an osprey, uh, generally speaking, limpkin hang out in freshwater systems. So this osprey is probably looking for fish in a freshwater area because the limpkin uh, feeds almost exclusively on freshwater mollusks. And mollusks are uh, clams, mussels, and snails. Uh, that's what they prefer. They have a special beak that's kind of chisel-like, a little bit offset so it can act as a wedge and open up bivalves. It can also use its beak to poke a hole in uh, an apple snail shell to release the vacuum and pull the snail out uh, and feed on that. Uh, one of the, maybe the only good thing of the recent introduction and spread of non-native apple snails, and apple snails are so called because they're very large freshwater snails, uh, some non-natives that have taken over is that their expansion has helped the limpkin also expand. Uh, limpkin is called limpkin because he limps. It's the way that he walks. There's no there's nothing wrong with him. That's just the way they, that's just the way he's put together. And that's what gave him his common name, Limpkin. Here's an adult feeding a baby, had to include adorable slide. Um, and this is a snail that's been extracted from its shell, uh, probably chopped up a little bit by mom's 
uh, scissor beak and then fed to the baby. They're nesting now, in fact. Um, they could look like an immature ibis. They do have a downturned beak like an ibis, uh, but, and they do have brown and white speckled, um, uh, I keep wanting to say foliage because I'm a botanist, plumage, there we go. Um, they do have the same speckled, but you're much more likely to see limpkin on their own. Uh, they're solitary, whereas the immature ibis are usually going to be found with other ibis. Uh, limpkins hang out by themselves until it's time to get married and start a family. Here we have the wood stork. It's the only stork that we have in the Southeast US. Um, it's not related to the egrets. It's not related to the herons. Uh, although it's the same size and it has a long beak, this is actually a vulture relative. This is a, um, a live food feeding vulture, interestingly. They have a lot of physiological similarities um, that, that ties them to the vultures. Uh, the, they are also like the, vulture, like the vultures, they're bald, uh, so they can stick their head underwater to feed. Uh, storks, wood storks, uh, have the fastest mechanism of any vertebrate species. The speed that its beak slams shut is faster than any other vertebrate species. It basically submerges its beak halfway in the water and kind of like the spoonbill waves it around and when it feels something move, even the slightest bit, it slams its beak down and feeds on all sizes uh, from fish to even minnows, snakes, turtles, frogs, anything it can, anything it can snap shut on and they make a pretty good living. These also have those reinforced flight feathers. So in flight, uh, neck outstretched, can't be an egret, uh, legs outstretched, uh, and there's these beautiful contrasting black and white wings. They're very, very graceful flyers. Uh, despite their appearance on land, they kind of mope around, kind of lope around in the air. They're extremely graceful, quite beautiful flyers. And here you can see that feeding mechanism uh, where they've got their beaks gaped, which is it's referred to. They keep their beaks open until they detect the slightest bit of movement and then slam shut. So here's a nice uh, assortment of preacher birds or wood storks. Uh, these are an endangered species in Florida. Uh, we have seen the numbers rebound, which is great, uh, through uh, habitat protection and pesticide decline. These animals are coming back, but they are still considered a threatened species. So here's a group of waders. Uh, this is quite the aggregation. We've got just about everybody here. We see an awful lot of the great egret. You can even see from a distance that yellow bill. We have the great blue being very, very tall, the unmistakable spoonbills, and I can probably identify even a, a stork in the background. So this is an area uh, in the springtime towards the end of the dry season here in Florida when bodies of water have dried up and concentrated whatever fish were in this pond into a small area. So these birds are basically just picking off all kind of, of yummy small animals that are being concentrated in, into less, more and more dense uh, conglomerations it's also springtime, which is when animals will be sizing each other up for the mating season. So you get a good meal, you get to hang out with friends, maybe even find boyfriend, girlfriend, move off, set up house, have children. So all these kind of things are tied together in the natural rhythms of the seasons here in Florida. Okay, now it's quiz time. So get ready. I hope you've all been paying attention. Uh, we're gonna do a little quiz. We're gonna do what's that waiter? Okay, what's this one? Black beak, yellow feet, got it? That's right, it's the snowy egret. Remember, yellow snow. Moving on, what's this one? It's the same size as the previous, but it has some, has some differences. Its beak is a different color, and it tends to hang out in different places. That's right, cattle egret. How about this guy? Uniform color, all one color, 
kind of a nice slaty mm, color. Yes, little blue heron. And bigger than a duck, yellow beak. If you could see, he'd have black feet. The great egret. And our largest, the word great comes to mind. Yes, the great blue heron. Who's got the downturned beak and no speckles? Do you remember? Sacred to some? Yes, it's the white ibis. Well done, 100%. Good job. Give yourselves a hand. And thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Again, I'm James Stevenson with the University of Florida IFAS Extension Services. Thanks for joining us. I'll leave the next slide up. If you have any questions, comments, complaints, concerns, or ways we can make our presentation better, please don't hesitate to contact me. It's my job at jstevenson at pinellascounty.org, or you could use the uh, email address that's here below my face, jb.stevenson at ufl.edu. Um, I'll check either one. Did want to let you know